Good morning and a beautiful day to you. Once again, Ninja has decided to come and join us for our uh, morning chat. Now, as we leave the land of sand and dust behind of Chad, we now are heading into the land of pyramids. And I don't mean Egypt. I mean somewhere that's got twice as many pyramids that e than Egypt. Sudan. But first, we have to leave Chad. Now, after recovering from our gruesome journey round Lake Chad, we then um, spent some time in the capital, cleaned everything up, stocked up as much as possible, got our visa for Sudan, which <laughs> that was quite interesting too. We turned up at the embassy in Sudan. The guy there, beautifully dressed in, in white, white. I mean, I don't know how he got the white so white. His suit was perfect and we were bedraggled in shorts and t-shirts and still a bit uh yeah anyway um turned up i uh, got ushered into this lovely office and the guy is sitting there and he takes our passport says you would like visas to visit sudan why do you want to go to sudan and we said well there's a couple of reasons partly we're driving through from the uk and we we're trying to get to south africa and this is our route through but we've also heard there's some amazing archaeological sites to visit in Sudan. And the guy was like, mm, flicking through our pages in the passport, looking at the stamps, a stamp from all the countries. And he's not looking very friendly. He says, mm, I don't know. Why should I give you the visa? And we're sort of like, is he asking for like a bribe or, or a thing? And we, so we just, uh, just keep quiet. And sometimes keeping quiet and letting them do the talking is the best option. They like to hear the sound of their own voices as much as they like stamping things. <laughs> anyway, and he goes, you're British, right? Said, yes. He says, Sudan used to be British colony. And I went, yeah, it, it, history, now it's independent. And of course, we're talking 20 years ago where Sudan was all one country because there was, now it's split into north and south. It's got as many problems now as it had then. And believe me, it has a lot of problems. And uh, he's going, uh, things were good under colonial rule. He said, uh, and he's like serious and so straight laced and we're sort of a bit nervous. We really need this visa. I mean, if we don't get this visa, we have to drive back round Lake Chad. We have no other, we have to get into Sudan. And he knows it. Um, otherwise, we have a torturous journey all the way back because other routes all closed at this point. So we're sort of like, oh my goodness, you know. At, um, and he goes, mm, colonials. Mm. At, uh, and he says, maybe, maybe you're, you're spies right, working for the British government. I go, um, no. Yeah. Maybe you'll come to plan to recolonialize. At, um, Sudan again. At this point, he closed the passports and he pushes them across the desk, you know, towards us. Hasn't put the stamp in or anything. And I thought, oh, I've had enough of this. And I say, that's, that's, I can't believe you worked it out, but that's exactly what we've been sent to do. We thought we'd sneak in through Morocco, drive right across the continent, sneak in here, get our visas and go into Sudan and then colonialize it, just the two of us, and uh, make Sudan great again. And Jennifer was sitting beside me going, what are you doing? This guy's never going to give us a visa if you say crazy things like that. And then the guy's face absolutely lit up. Huge smile comes over his face. He gets the parcel back. He says, oh, that is so great. Dunk, dunk. Please, colonialise Sudan again. <laughs> gave us our visas. <laughs> so it, uh, we were like, okay, thank you very much. And then, as traditionally, because um, as... We will soon find out. Sudanese people are so incredibly hospitable and friendly. Um, it's a shame they're politically and geographically in such a mess. But the people themselves are amazing. And he said, come, let's have a cup of tea. And got a cup of tea and we joked about, you know, um, recolonializing Sudan and what we would do with it. And, and, uh, and he told us about his family and how he really wants, he didn't like being in Chad and he really wants to go home. Um, and yeah, it was really actually quite a nice experience and didn't start off well, ended okay. We ended up walking out there with visas for Sudan. So that we did in Jamina and then we had to briefly cross Chad and the road conditions and there was, there's nothing 
to see really in Chad it might have changed now, but in those days you were just glad to leave, I'm afraid. Um, and it still ranks as one, or even then it was worse. Actually, is it now? Worse than now? Anyway, it's still one of Africa's most dangerous countries to cross. So we didn't tarry long because p pretty much between N'Djamena and the border with Sudan, we wild camped the entire time. We avoided civilization as much as possible. You take the main road and there's really only one route across and you just tuck yourself and hide away at night. One night we were camping, we made the mistake of tucking north because you're still on the Sahara edge there. We tucked our way into the desert, hid in this beautiful little campsite. Um, it was so, so beautifully quiet. It was a particularly starry night. It was really nice. The moon came up late, so we had the stars as we went to sleep. And then the moon came up and bathed the whole desert in this silver, silver light. Really, really beautiful. And uh, we're still sleeping on the roof with a mozzie net, no tent or anything, sleeping there. And sometime in the night, Jennifer is like nudging me, going, wake up, wake up. And I'm like, what is it, what is it, what is it, what's the problem? And she says, listen, and we could hear this rumble. Of, and we're like, what on earth is that? Um, so we, you know, sort of don't put any lights on, but you stand up, and of course you've got this beautiful moonlight. We stand up. And uh, looking around, you know, if we stand on the roof of the Land Rover, we've tucked ourselves between some sand dunes. We stand on the roof, we can actually just see over the tops to the road down on one side that would come off. And then into the desert on the other side to see what on earth this mysterious rumble noise. And it was getting louder. I think It's not an aeroplane. And into view, in the sunlight, comes this huge military patrol. Tanks, missile launchers heading off the road, crossing the desert about a kilometre in front of us and disappearing into the desert somewhere. And we're going, OK, let's just hunker down, make no noise, no light, and hope they don't see us. And it took about half an hour for this military procession or whatever it was to go by, disappeared somewhere in the desert, and we didn't sleep well the rest of the night. We were very nervous. But that was the tail end of Chad. Next day, we were at the border. Chad Sudan again it's like a nowhere place there is there's this ridiculous scenario where we've got a couple of huts um, and a meter of fence and then the fence ends in Sahara Desert either side so you know it's, the border is there as a token border to show this is where the border is and for crazy people like ourselves to actually get some paperwork stamped um, because everybody else just walks around the border I mean the locals from either side were just wandering around nobody just went through the border they just walk around anyway um, uh, we turned up and we got out of Chad, no problem, and it was late afternoon on a Thursday afternoon. Then uh, it's about a kilometre drive to the Sudanese border. And when we got there, it was closed. Oh, oh, no, we just it's like, it's three in the afternoon on a Thursday afternoon. Now, we hadn't factored in two things that we later learned. One, there's a time difference between Chad and Sudan, which meant we were one hour late for the border for that day. Secondly, in those days, I don't know if it's changed much now, I think it may have deteriorated, Sudan was practicing religious tolerance to all. Or well, that's what they said they were doing. The officials said. So, in recognition of that, to recognize all the different religions in their respective holidays, the border was then closed on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays to respect all the different religions would now only be open on Monday and we turned up just after it closed on a Thursday afternoon and we had already left Chad so we were literally in no man's land so we couldn't cross the border we couldn't go back because we didn't have a visa for Chad anymore and anyway there was nothing on the Chad side anyway for hundreds of kilometers so we we're stuck there and um, the border officials closed up gone nothing and it's like, basically come back Monday Come back Monday. We're going to stay here till Monday. We can't go anywhere. Thankfully, Land Rover and plenty of supplies. We just basically parked at the border post. And we had to then camp and wait for the three days. And I was like, oh, it was hot and it was tired. And there was absolutely no shade apart from what we made to our, of ourselves. Um, and what was really annoying is the actual border wasn't 
physically closed. They didn't even bother closing the gate. The locals were going and going, things were driving through, busing, just nobody stamping anything. The problem is we needed stamps both in our passports and in our vehicle carnet. Otherwise it would cause us problems when we tried to leave Sudan and go, because the officials love to make sure you've stamped everywhere en route. So we could have actually driven through, but we wouldn't have got stamps. So we had to wait. So we saw all these other people going to and fro, and we're sat there at the scorching border post on the edge of the desert, neither out, well, neither in Sudan, but out of Chad. <sighs> now, on the second day, uh, one of the border officials uh, said, would you, you know, uh, would you like a shower? We can, we have a shower you can use. And we go, oh, that's great, especially Jennifer. I mean, we'd been several days just wild camping all the way across, so we hadn't had running water. Just the water we had in Cannes, we're using it sparingly. And he went, yes, yes, no problem. At, um, and he went round the back and he went into the, round the back of the um, border post, it's a small little building, and he came, comes out carrying a, a big brick like this, a big breeze block. It's a bit strange and then he walks down the fence and there's like a, um, a concrete building at the end and he disappears in the building and there's some noises and he puts his hand come 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 shower shower and um so we walk, walk down and oh shower this could be gonna be good so hot and sticky and sweaty it's hot at night it's hotter during the day and there's sand everywhere it's like oh so a good shower will help us feel better while we sit here waiting for the border to open um and uh, go into the building, got no door or anything, it's just, you know, concrete square thing. And in the middle of the floor, he's placed this brick. And beside it, he's put a bucket. Shower! There you go. <laughs> that was the shower. So bless him, he was trying. Again, that, that friendly Sudanese, make do with what we've got, help you if we can attitude. He had provided us with a shower. So he didn't even provide water. We had a brick in the middle of the floor and a bucket to put water in. <laughs> so we could put some water in, dip it over your head. Even that felt good to, to get rid of all the muck. But uh, that was our border shower for the next couple of days until Monday morning came around. Oh, we were like up nice and early, ready to go. The official didn't turn up till 12 o'clock. <laughs> like, oh, come on, we just want to get to Khartoum um, in Sudan because we had decided that after all this long trekking, and so much wild camping that we would treat ourselves to a nice aircon hotel in Khartoum for a few days while we were there and clean everything because I mean we had no facilities to clean anything clothes the vehicle barely ourselves for now for months in a proper way so um, but so we didn't make Khartoum that day because the officials turned up late and then they wanted to chat and have tea. They didn't see much going on in that, especially of outsiders. And they were very, very friendly and there was no problems. They just wanted to enjoy your company, which is really fascinating. But we really wanted to get to Khartoum. Anyway, we spent some time with them, had some nice tea, got our stamps and our passports, got our stamps and the carnet and then trundled across to Khartoum. And it was actually quite remarkable. The road, that road across, was a fairly new road and we hadn't been on a decent tar road for like eight months now. The last tar road we got that didn't have holes in it or covered with sand was in Morocco. And we had pretty much at this point crossed the entire Sahara Desert. And it had been a mission. We learnt a lot, especially about ourselves. So it took us a couple of days to actually get into Khartoum at, um, and we rocked up fairly late on the second day and um, we we hadn't done any research about hotels. There's no online then, you basically at those point you had some uh, the, the guidebook we had which listed a few hotels or you literally just had to drive around the hotels, rock up, ask what the prices are. But we couldn't be bothered to do that night and we heard the only place to camp in Khartoum was actually at the university. So we went to the university and it was late in the evening and uh, got to the gate. And there's this barrier across and this guy looking at us, a dusty Land Rover and these two strange people. And uh, he came out and uh, that's the other thing. When you get to Sudan, English. I mean, they a lot of them spoke really good English. And we were still in the French mode, French and Arabic, because most of us, uh, the route we'd go across was 
ex-French colonies and the common language was French and Arabic. So we were still speaking French and Arabic. And this guy was speaking to us in flawless English. You were like, okay, we can speak English. We can do this. Um, and we said that we needed somewhere to camp for the night. Oh, oh, yes, 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 come on. And it was quite dark. And uh, he guided us through. He walked with a torch in front and, and showed us where and this is a beautiful uh, area. Um, with nothing there, just it's completely empty, you know, like the, all the university buildings were spread out around. Just, you, you, you can sleep here. And uh, I go, how much? And he goes, oh, no, no, that's free, free, it's okay. And this is what we found a lot in Sudan. The generosity of the people was amazing. So we set up a camp, put a little, made a little fire in the ground, uh, not on the grid, it's just on the ground, uh, cooked our supper, um, and then there was some, we could use the sports facilities for washing, so we actually had showers with warm water, running water and showers and uh, cleaned up, oh it was wonderful. Then we went to bed and crashed and we were tired, we hadn't had a good night's sleep for some time. And we woke up because it was getting hot. And this is the thing, Sudan, I don't know if they even have a summer and a winter, there is hot even hotter and extremely hot and it seemed to be that we were there in the extremely hot time so we woke up fairly early as soon as the sun came up but it was still like about 6 37 in the morning and we sort of sit up and like oh and then and I pull the mosquito net <laughs> and i look around and we are surrounded <laughs> by all these people in football gear um, they were actually um, girls um, in football gear not guys and we're like, okay, what's going on? The guy, the security guy, had had his camp in the middle of the campus football pitch. <laughs> and that morning, they were meant to be having a football, uh, there was a game on. And we were camped in the middle of it. They didn't wake us up or anything. And we had made a fire in their football pitch as well, right in the centre circle. <laughs> we didn't see that at night. Um, and all these, they're just sitting there patiently waiting for us to, they didn't wake us up, they didn't chase us off, and of course when I saw it, I was like, I'm so, 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 that, that's okay. Um, you know, we, we'll have the football match later. Um, we've had breakfast, and, and if you can move your vehicle, we'll carry on with the football match, but you can come and have breakfast, because uh, all the breakfast is laid out. So I drove the vehicle off the football pitch to park it beside the pitch. Um, and they started their game, but then uh, one of the people said, come, come, and they took us into the thing, and there's this, the, the, Tables have been laid out in this building for breakfast for the football team teams, and uh, and they said just help yourselves. And it was lovely. There was fruit, and it wasn't a huge variety, but it was really nice, fresh, and welcome. And the people there were so nice, and they were all coming to talk to us, and and they wanted to practice their English, and their English was fantastic. Um, and yeah, we made some great friends of the people there. It, it's, uh, and the other thing I noticed at that point, and I think this has been a problem for Sudan, and it's still ongoing, is that at this university and the people that came to speak to us, they were from all different cultural backgrounds and religious backgrounds, and they were all getting on. Christian, Muslim, all different kind. There was no issues between them. And all the people were equally hospitable and curious to us, as in many countries around the world, Politics and money are what can cause the problems. The people themselves just want to live a peaceful life. And they were so, so kind to us. Um, so we spent the day at the university. Uh, we sat and chatted to all the football team. We made some great friends. They gave us a tour of the university. It was the main university in Khartoum. And uh, then they helped us have a little, little look around town because in, in Khartoum is where the longest river in the world combines because it's not the biggest river in the world in terms of water volume, but the actual longest in distance that it travels is the Nile. And as you go further down from Egypt, going south, you've actually got the Blue Nile and the White Nile, and they're quite distinctive colours. You can see why they're called the Blue and the White, and in Khartoum is where they meet. So we went to see that. We saw Lord Kitchener's gunboat and uh, had tea on the, on the deck of the gunboat that was left there by the British in, I think, 1901 or something like that. And then they helped us get what we were going to need for our next most important uh, visit was our archaeological permits. Because as I said earlier, there is more pyramids in Sudan than there is in Egypt, twice as many. You don't have the big, big, large scale ones, but there is areas of Sudan that is littered with pyramids and nobody goes to see them because it's really difficult to get there. And I think even nowadays it's probably even more difficult to go and see them. And they're not regulated in the same way. They have a guardian 
So what you have to do, you have to go to the archaeological office in, in Khartoum and Khartoum traffic. Oh my goodness, it is manic. And we hadn't been, we hadn't been used to crossing the desert. We'd hardly seen other vehicles. And then you get to Khartoum and boom, poof, it was just maniac. Thankfully, the Land Rover was quite big. You can bully your way through. Um, but we yes, had to get to the archaeological office and get permits to go to a place called Moreau and one other archaeological site that we were going to go to and go and visit right out in the desert. They're not near anywhere and they've been semi-discovered. Like they've been discovered, located, but nobody's done a lot of research on them or, or looked into them, not in recent years. So we went and got the permits and they helped us with that. And then we stayed another night at the university, had a great evening chatting to people. And then the next day we went to our hotel. We'd found a hotel. Uh, for us, it was expensive. And I remember rocking into the parking area. It, uh, our Land Rover hadn't been washed now for eight months. Eight months. And it had crossed the Sahara Desert in that time. We had sort of regularly emptied out and sweep half of the desert out of it because all the sand was coming in. But that was it. We didn't waste water on that. So we rocked up to this car park and the security guard at the gate looked at us and looked at the state of our Land Rover, Lara, and shook his head. And, um, and you know, he said, what are you doing here? He said, we've checked into the hotel. And he looked at us and it was a, a, I don't think it was a Hilton, but it was a nice four or five star hotel we had treated ourselves to. I think it might have been a Radisson. And he was not used to our level of scruffiness coming into his hotel. And he went, no, 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 this will not do. At, uh, and I said, yes, we, we've been across the desert, we need to clean the vehicle. And you need to clean you, he said, it's very subtle. Like, hey, do I look that bad? Well, our clothes were a bit... Mm. Um, so he wouldn't let me drive into the main car park. I said, you park over there. There was no car. You know, all these nice posh cars. And the people in Sudan really look after their cars in this sort of level. And uh, there's all these nice, posh, clean, sparkly cars down this side and an empty gap on this side. You park there. Don't go near those ones. You park there. Parked over there. And then... <laughs> <laughs> we emptied the vehicle out um, because we know we needed to clean everything. We had these boxes and bags. Everything was boxed and bags. So it wasn't uh, t such a long-winded thing, but there were six big boxes and six big bags to and a fridge to take everything out. And of course, everything was filthy. And we were taking it out and then going into the reception of this posh hotel and then putting it in the lift <laughs> and going to our room <laughs> where we're going to clean everything down and dripping dust behind us everywhere. The people in the hotel didn't bat an eyelid. They were so good. They helped us with the boxes. They understood what we were going to do. They brought extra water in and they actually provided us a place, not in the room, so we could clean everything. Meanwhile, the security guard, he didn't go and get someone else. He got the thing and he cleaned our Land Rover inside and out. And when I offered him some money for it, no, no, no. He says, I don't allow dirty cars in my car park, so I keep them all clean. And she was spotless. It, uh, so that was actually a very, very nice experience. And we had a couple of days of luxury of aircon, not cooking, not camping. Not that I don't miss it, because I love going out on the outside, but when you've been in the desert for such a long time, that luxury was lovely. Although one thing, I couldn't sleep so well for two reasons. One, the bed felt so soft after sleeping on the roof of the Land Rover for so long. And secondly, I got claustrophobic. I've never been claustrophobic in my life before, but after spending so long outside, and with open sky every night, when I got into bed and turned the light, I felt like the walls were closing in on me. So it was very comfortable, but I was still glad to get back to the landy and start camping out again. Because our next trip, with archaeological permits in hand, was, was Moreau, heading north into the desert of the Nubian desert to see the remnants of the Nubian Empire. Now, there's lots of theories about these pyramids. But it is absolutely, it's, it is, in a lot of ways, more amazing than the pyramids of Egypt, the pyramids of Giza. Because, I mean, you've got a few pyramids there, the size is awe-inspiring and the history is thing. But these pyramids, there is a Moreau, I think, has 86 pyramids, mostly in good condition, in the desert, in a most beautiful setting. And there is nothing and nobody there. We rocked up, we had our paperwork so we could... Uh, uh, stay there and go and visit them, which you have to get in in cartoon, which we'd got. Nobody came. Nobody saw us. We rocked up, and there are the pyramids, just around. No railings, no people, no tourists, no touts, 
nothing. We were the only people there. And we just rocked up, camped, and uh, when I was setting up the camp, parked the Land Rover near this beautiful temple um, that was like half restored and half buried in the sand. And um, then I went to make a fire. Now we've got a grill, it's a very sandy area, and I was looking for rocks to like make a little uh, fire circle. And everything I picked up was a bit of archaeology. You know, I picked up something, it was part of it, had hieroglyphics on it. When I picked up this rock, it was part of a temple or a, a carving of a lot. Everything lying around, history was just lying around us. And this is history that is hundreds, if not thousands of years old. So I gave up on the rocks and we just dug, dug a hole in the sand and made a fire for the night. And the next day we went out exploring this area, looking around these pyramids. It's truly amazing. Again, still nobody came. Uh, we then drove to our second site, another place where is um, there's not so many pyramids there. Although you do, at, on the drive you see these pyramids just dotted in the desert, randomly. Beautiful pyramids. Um, and we got to our second place, which is like by a mountain overlooking the Nubian desert with these semi-explored um, uh, temples and things. But the only people exploring these areas are students from Germany who come for two weeks every year and they've been slowly over the and I think when we were there the project had been going for like about 20 years and they, they were just basically uncovering different parts they go there they do their stuff for two weeks of the year and, go, and then nothing happens for another the rest of the year until they come back so we had the privilege of camping there and it was amazing uh, we camped near the Lion Temple which uh, I'll just put up on the screen here. Um, it's a beautifully preserved now, semi-restored temple with an amazing altar, uh, uh, fresco altar in beautiful colours painted in it. And uh, we went climbing up the mountain that gave it these beautiful views over the area. And you could see when you look down, all the, it through the sand, it's a shame I didn't have a drone then. I would have loved that. Um, and the shots would have been spectacular. You could see the outlines of where buildings would have been in this area. And there were so many. It must have been a city must have been there at some point. There was hundreds of foundations that you could see buried in the sound in this area. And there was one temple that had been uncovered. That's it. And in the mountain where we were, there was, you know, the big blocks that they carve out to make the pyramids and buildings. You could see some of these blocks hand carved that were still attached to the cliff where for some reason they stopped building but they'd carved out these perfect square blocks for the construction in this mountain quarry and taken down and sitting around there were these pitchers uh, you know old earthenware jugs which were obviously water jugs for the workers and thing just sitting there perfectly preserved for maybe a thousand plus years it is absolutely amazing it really was a beautiful and stunning place i would love to go back and visit i hope a lot of these places have been preserved because because of their vulnerability in that there's nobody there and nobody goes there a lot of unscrupulous dealers antiquities dealers from around the world basically come and raid the stuff they take the statues the frescoes and all the bits of history and smuggle them across into egypt and then sell them internationally so over the years a lot of this history has been disappearing but we enjoyed it and what was there. And I mean, we were looking at history. I mean, we found graffiti from 100 and 200 years ago that explorers who had discovered them then, British and German explorers, had carved into the bricks of the temple from 1800. It, it was spectacular. And if I ever get the chance to go again and it's safe again, I would go again at a heartbeat. It was mind-blowingly beautiful and uh, that was our main experience of Sudan the desert the temples and the friendly people